So our last speaker, and I've already had questions from a couple of you who I see in the room. Why are you having somebody from Massachusetts speak at the Red State Gathering? Well, look, we've got Mitt Romney here. We wouldn't let him speak necessarily, except now that he's the nominee, but we actually have a guy from Massachusetts. I was debating whether or not I wanted to even endorse a guy from Massachusetts. They can't be pro-life out there, can they? They can't. They can't really be that conservative out there, can they? He's a Marine. Small businessman. Uh, he could kick my butt if he wanted to. Uh, Sean Bielan ran against Barney Frank, and it was the first time, you will remember this, it was the first time Barney Frank ever had to run for his money in Congress uh, two years ago, and he came very close to beating Barney Frank. Uh, and in fact, what's happening now? Barney Frank decided not to run again. my favorite Democratic members of Congress because he actually says, my favorite quote of any congressman is from Barney Frank. Believe it or not, be a liberal or a conservative because moderates stand for nothing. That's Barney Frank actually said that. I agree with him. Be a conservative, not a liberal because liberals stand for everything wrong, I would say. But nonetheless, so Sean Bielet is back again two years later. He's running for Congress. He is pro-life. He is a family man, he's a small businessman, he is a Marine, not a former Marine, I learned. The only former Marine was what's his name from Pennsylvania to throw under the bus. Congressman departed. He is a Marine. He's actually active in the reserves. And I fully support him for Congress. And there are a lot of you who are here in districts around the country where your guy is going to win or going to lose no matter what. You know the writings of the law. You're in a 70% Republican district. You're in a 70% Democratic district. Well, you can always pray for candidates. I mean, you can always go knock on doors for candidates. You can also, if you're looking for candidates who are in a different state, when your state's not very competitive and you need to support them, you can support a guy like Sean Bielat, who will up, you know, Republicans never win in New England except we've taken over a bunch of legislatures up there. 10, but we still never win in New England. This is another one of those races that we can't win in New England that, in fact, we can kick butt in New England with a guy like Sean B. Lapp. Good afternoon. Uh, it is never an enviable position to go right before to play, right? Uh, nevertheless, I'll in 2010, the key to what success I did have against Barney Frank, which frankly was fairly substantial. We just didn't cross the finish line. But he is retiring, so I feel pretty good about that. In 2010, that success was largely built on social media. So in the primary, which in Massachusetts is in September, up till that point, nobody had really paid much attention. When September came around and we started getting into the general, we nationalized it. And when that happened, money started coming in, the media started paying attention, and next thing you know, Barney Sway put in $200,000 of his own money. Uh, on election day, the reporters who were with him, I've been told, said that he thought he was going to lose. So we put some fear into him, we made him work for his job, and competition is good in all of this, and it's particularly good in elections. Too often in Massachusetts, there have not been competitive choices on the ballot. So yes, Massachusetts is currently a very blue state, but I have high hopes. And I'm basing that on the fact that once you get out there, once you talk to voters, you find that they're not necessarily very liberal, they're just very democratic. And again, that's because they have had choices. So when you get in front of voters and you talk to them about conservative ideas, and you talk to them about a rationale for conservative ideas, there's sort of this there's this moment where they say, wow, these guys aren't just the party of the rich that's trying to take you know, money from grandma and throw her out on the street. They actually have some ideas and they're valid ideas and they might actually make things a little bit better. So we're having some success, we're making some gains, and a lot of it has to do with the social media. So in, I'll give you a little bit more about the race in 2010. Um, I was obviously a no name candidate. Uh, my name ID hovered below zero. Um, we had no money. I had never run a race before. I was running against a 16-term incumbent in one of the more gerrymandered districts in the country. If you see the map, 
It's just a disgusting <laughs> mess. It looks like a snake. That's right. Um, and he had all the money in the world. But again, it comes down to this competitive dynamic. So we worked really hard. We got people out. We talked to voters, and it started to shift. So what's different this year is we have a much better district. Redistricting helped a lot. He took a look at it. He didn't like to work for his job in the first place. He especially didn't want to work for his job in a district where he was going to lose. And I wish he had because I would have loved to have run against him this year. Unfortunately, that didn't occur. So in terms of bio, Eric just told you a little bit about, uh, about me. I'm a, I'm a Marine. Um, I did a, my undergraduate work at, at Georgetown, and then I did a master of public policy at Harvard. I used to call it the Kennedy School. Since I'm running against Joe Kennedy, I no longer call it that. Um, and then I did an MBA award, and it's that last, that last one that's the most important. For most of the past decade, I've been working in business. First, I worked as a management consultant at McKinsey & Company, so focused on very large corporations and uh, their growth, their profitability, growing jobs, doing the things you need to do to move, move the economy forward. Then I worked at a company called iRobot, which is a Massachusetts technology company. It makes robots. They make the Roomba, which is a little bag of you may have seen. And then I think the cooler side is the defense business. That's where I worked. And I ran a $100 million product line of defense robots. These are the ones used to go after the roadside bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. You may have seen them in the movie The Hurt Locker. There's one that breaks down. That was our competitor. Ours was much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that, I, I, I went and consulted independently to small tech companies. And now I run an online startup focused on political, grassroots political advocacy. And again, the reason I mention these things is because those are the important credentials in a year like this year. Voters care about the economy. They care about growth. They care about getting people in Washington, in Washington who have experience in those areas. If you don't have experience in these areas, you end up with the kind of things we're seeing, the you didn't create it mentality. The mentality that says, sure, you can raise taxes in an economic downturn and it won't cause any problems. The mentality that says, it's all right for Congress to tell you how to buy something, to tell insurers that they have to provide something, to tell, um, to tell doctors that they have to take less money for doing the same job. And these people still expect it to not make any difference in the market. And so you kind of scratch your head and you say, where did this come from? Well, it came from people selecting uh, representatives, congressmen, not for the wrong reasons. But what I really wanted to talk about today is really national security. As a Marine, as somebody who spent time in the national security and the defense industry and then in the intelligence space, it's an area I care a lot about. And it's been a disgrace to watch what has happened in Washington over the past few years. When you look at what happened in Afghanistan, here you had this, this green candidate with no uh, experience of running anything, no military experience, no international experience. He wants to get us out of Iraq on a certain date. And so what does he do? He says, well, Afghanistan's the right war. We need to surge there. So he carries that on. Does he have a discernible strategic purpose? No. But he lived up to his campaign promise and sent a bunch of troops over there. And the civilian leadership has failed them. Uh, they have done everything we've asked them to do. Our soldiers and Marines, we can be proud of them. They have achieved every mission they've been given. Their civilian leadership has failed them. In Libya, we saw an administration that just totally circumvented the Congress, the constitutional duty of the Congress to declare war and to oversee the use of force. The administration just ran. And most recently, and to me, in some ways more egregiously, is the intelligence leaks. And I had to write these down because there's so many of them, so you don't have to excuse me as I consult my notes here. Um, so you have the Osama bin Laden mission, right? You would think it was a made-for-TV movie the way the administration played it up afterwards. They told you just about, they did just about everything but put Obama in front of the, the seal tickets. SEAL Team 6, uh, SEAL so to carry out the mission, right? They could have photoshopped his head in there, everybody at the White House would have applauded. What they did was give away operational detail, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that SEALs used to conduct these operations. Do you think anybody might be interested in that in the future? Yes. But, hey, maybe you'll get it realigned. In that same effort, they revealed uh, about this Pakistani doctor who put his life on the line, or literally, to help us gain the intel we needed to identify the location of Osama bin Laden. Well, he's now doing 33 years in a Pakistani prison. But that's justified in the hands of people in the White House where they think anything goes if they can get four more years. They think that's a fair trade. 
Um, if you think about the cyber attacks and the information that was released on the cooperation of the Israelis and the Americans on getting the Stuxnet virus in that was able to uh, shut down the, some of the equipment used to, to form what they need to, to build a nuclear device. Um, we put that out there. Worked well for Obama, made him look good, made him look tough. Didn't do a whole lot for the Israelis. Didn't do a whole lot for our ability to get in and conduct a similar cyber operation in the future. Maybe they'll get, get him reelected. Might be worth it. Um, if you look at the operation in Yemen, where the administration leaked that there was a double agent involved and that he was a brick, threw the Brits under the bus, but hey, might get him reelected. Um, if you look this week at the secret intelligence finding that was on the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times, the secret one, um, how did that get out? Again, now you're putting at risk the Americans involved in Syria the Syrian sources that they're working with, and then the Turks who are providing, I shouldn't even be able to talk about this, I shouldn't know about it because it shouldn't have been on the front page of paper, but again, throwing an ally under the bus for the sake of political expediency, political gain, and hopeful re-election. That's disgusting. It's, it's reprehensible, and it's bad for our national security. So, so in defense of Obama, he says that it is offensive and wrong to say that this came from the White House. Offensive and wrong, right? I'll tell you what's offensive and wrong. What's offensive and wrong is for him to throw the rest of the administration. So what's he saying? He's saying the Department of Defense is responsible for the leaks? Is he saying the CIA is? And oh, by the way, don't they all work for him? Does it, isn't the buck spot supposed to stop in the Oval Office? And that's what we've got. That's, that's what this administration is. That's what we've come to. And so they are flouting, uh, they're, they're just stepping away from their national security responsibilities at will for reelected purposes. But there's another guilty party here, and that's the Congress. Constitutionally, the Congress has an important role to play in foreign policy. Although the executive is given the authority to conduct foreign policy and pursue national security, the Congress has an obligation to fund uh, and ultimately decide whether forces justified by the force can legally be used. And they have entirely stepped away from that responsibility. So in the post-World War II era, 100,000 Americans have been killed in Korea, Vietnam, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. 100,000 American lives have been lost. Not once has Congress declared war. And so in the early 70s, you had the War Powers Resolution, and, and we came up with this formal process of allowing uh, the president to send troops somewhere for 60 days, and then he comes back to the Congress and they have to approve. Well, last year, Obama sent military forces to, uh, to fight over Syria, to, over Libya, right now. He didn't ask the Congress. 60 days passed. He said he didn't need to ask the Congress. And the Congress didn't hold him accountable. Dennis Kucinich pushed for a vote in the House on whether to revoke the, or, or to call for an end to the, uh, to the operation. The House Republicans went along until it looked like it was going to pass, and then they pulled back. Because there was enough support in the House to say, you know what, this is wrong. The President shouldn't have this authority. Agree or disagree with the, the, the operation itself, we can have different opinions on that. But the process should be clear as defined by the Constitution. And maybe if you like the guy in the Oval Office and you agree with his policies, it's all right to see him in power. But if you don't, not so much. So now we've set the precedent for, for the President to be able to deploy troops, use forces, basically at will. And so I think it's important, if we care about issues like this, if we care about getting back to the core aspects of the Constitution, that we elect representatives and senators who believe that as well, in all areas. Um, too often Republicans, to point out my party, uh, too often Republicans will sort of rubber stamp anything military because they support military, generally speaking, they support the troops. That's not the right way to do business. We owe it to the people of this country to give them a voice, and the way we give them that voice is through the Congress. There is, in my race this year, another gentleman, he has the last name, Kennedy, you may have heard of these guys before. Uh, they've been around a little while, seven years almost. Um, turns out, I looked this up or figured it out. Um, when a Kennedy achieves federal office, 
is they're on an average of 18 years. So if you want to keep this next generation out, I suggest you get involved. But different story, I'll get to that in a minute. So if you think of the value of having elected officials who are constitutionally focused, who do define uh, what we should do based on, on those values, then you have to look at what else is available. And then what else is this other thing, this, this Kennedy vision, this brand that's been around for these decades. So Joe Kennedy III, who is my particular opponent, is 31 years old. Um, nothing wrong with being young and ambitious. I'm not too much older than he is. He's got a total of two years of uh, work experience in the Peace Corps and then two years of work experience as an assistant prosecutor. So that's what he's bringing to the table. Um, he moved into the district a week before he got into race. Never run for anything. If his name wasn't Kennedy, no one would be covering this race. But instead, the day he announced, he had the BBC there, he had the New York Times, he had the Washington Post, everybody and their brother was there for the media. And the reason they were there is the same reason that he's been able to outraise everyone in Congress in the first 10 weeks besides Alan West and John Boehner. This is a race that people nationally are paying attention to. And in fact, um, next weekend he's going to have at the uh, Kennedy Compound in Hyannis, he's going to have uh, Nancy Pelosi there, Barney Frank, most of the congressional delegation from Massachusetts, Ethel's hosting it, Ted Jr. is going to be there. It's going to be a great time. You can go for $38,000. You can get a photo with young Joe, so I can tell you where to send the check if you're interested. Um, the reason for that, the reason for the money, the reason for the press, is because of this Kennedy brand. People don't know who this guy is. They don't know what he's done. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't give press conferences. He won't answer reporters. He doesn't go in front of cameras or do radio. But the reason people like this guy is the brand. Because that brand represents something. It represents larger government. Government. It represents higher taxes. It represents moving more power away from states and local, local governments to Washington. It's the quintessential liberal brand. And what was Ted Kennedy's moniker? It was the liberal line in the Senate. They had defined, defined that vision. And so there's this other vision, and it's, it's the one that I represent. And that's of a smaller, more limited federal government, lower taxes, more individual responsibility, and the ability and likelihood of individuals to succeed under their own merits. And so as you, as you look at the election this November, as you, as you look around at what's going on, in most races, you have two similar choices. And so the question is, again, why, why, why listen to somebody in Massachusetts talk about this, this one race? The reason is, you can't vote for me. There are hardly anyone in here. Maybe, Christian, if you haven't changed your registration yet. Um, hardly anyone, if anyone, can vote for me. But I can vote for all of you. That's what makes this race as important as every other winnable Senate and House race this cycle. And make no mistake, this is a winnable race. This new district is fantastic. Uh, Scott Brown's hometown is in there, along with this old state senate district. We've got a huge volunteer base. The only thing we don't have to the same degree he does is money. And so I'm here. I'm going to depend again on social media. I'm going to be reaching out to, to make this race national. And I'm going to be asking for grassroots support. Last time we had 23,000 donors from around the country who gave us about $2.5 million. For a congressional race, that's big, num big uh, money and big numbers. And so I'm going to depend on that again. Um, so, so that's it. <laughs> that is what I came to, do, to talk to you about today. I came to talk to you about the importance of having the Congress actually play its role in standing up to the executive. God forbid Obama get reelected, but if he does, we need a strong Congress. Even if he doesn't, we need a strong Congress. And so I ask for your help in making that happen. Thank you. Uh, well, Young Joe debate you? We've got two scheduled, and then the third has been requested by a local uh, TV station. I don't know if we'll do that, but we're going to try. I did 10 with Barney. So the precedent is, is to have you know a number. So I'm definitely going to hold this meeting to, to the bar on that. What are the character, voting characteristics of your, of the, of your uh, 
District. Well, uh, if, I don't know how well you know Boston, but in the towns immediately around Boston, there's a third of the world population. Uh, Brookline and Newton. Um, they're also heavily Jewish. He uh, does take a very strong stance on Israel and a much uh, stronger stance, so there's actually a lot more support in that community than there might ordinarily be. Um, the rest of it, though, is, is, is very uh, middle America. Uh, at the southern part of the district, along the Rhode Island border, there's a town called Fall River, where unemployment is almost 12%. Uh, between that end of the district and the northern part, it's, it reflects most of the country. It's, um, it's middle class, working families, they care about the same issues that you would expect most Americans do, and they vote accordingly. Right. Uh, you mentioned that it would be unwise for uh, Congress to rubber stamp uh, military spending. What's your position on the defense military sequestration funds? Well, I said military action, but in fact, the similar point. Um, it would be devastating. I mean, there's no, uh, no other way to put it. Even we on the meta admits that, um, which tells you, tells you something. But one of the things that's attached to that, a point that I always like to bring up is, uh, I can't tell you if what sequestration would do would create the right size force. The reason I can't tell you that is because the right size force will work. There has been no uh, uh, real effort for this administration to define what our strategy is and what force is needed to meet that strategy. There's things in the national security strategy of the United States. One of the components says multilateralism, essentially, is a focus. It's a strategic end in and of itself. I don't know how to equip for that. So until we get a, a, an administration with a real view as to what we're trying to accomplish, you can't get the four sides right. That being said, there's a ton to cut in defense bureaucracy. It's about 800,000 people in the defense bureaucracy. Uh, 67,000 of them have been added in the past three and a half years. So at the same time we're pro proposing cutting 80,000 soldiers and Marines, we're talking about adding 67,000 defense bureaucrats. There's a lot to cut there. There's a lot to cut in the acquisition process. But I would leave um, combat capability, core combat capability alone until we figure out uh, what it is we're trying to accomplish. All right. uh, Major, it's not an overstatement in my view to say that Bernie Frank might have been the same. tell you, if I were at, at, ever able to vote on repeal or partial repeal of Dodd-Frank, I would do that in half hour. <laughs> Financial services are very important in Boston and in the surrounding area. Uh, it's, it's probably not one of the committees I would choose for. I'd be interested in budget. I'd be interested in ways and means. I'd be interested in armed services. Um, if anybody out there is listening, plays a role in making those decisions. Talk to me in November, please. Um, and so I probably wouldn't focus on, on financial services per se. Um, as far as specific members, I don't know. Um, you know, I can tell you on budget, it's, you, you got Paul and you got guys like that who are fantastic. Uh, on financial services specifically, uh, banking policy tends to be fairly arcane. Um, and so it's only when there's the big sweeping things like that, Frank, that I think it's, it's uh, something that Uh, first, I want to thank you for your service to the nation. Um, the second issue... The second issue, um, up in Watchdog Wire in Florida, uh, there is an active... The Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, according to John Fun in their recently released book, Who's Counting? Uh, is, is actively suppressing the military overseas vote. <clears throat> and they're doing it by not enforcing the law that requires absentee ballots to go out to our men and women overseas, mm -hmm. not only in the military, but of course also working in our uh, you know, other agencies, State Department and so on. The key is they have, they have to go out 
45 days in advance. Florida has a statute that requires the absentee ballots to go out. What is the situation in, in Massachusetts? Uh, in Massachusetts, there is at least nominally a push to uh, get ballots out to the military as well as everyone else. We, are, uh, we have an active um, absentee ballot program to push them out. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're working pretty hard on that. Um, I think it'll make some difference. Uh, so we'll see. What, uh, what effect will presidential race have on your, on your election, do you think? How I strong think will Romney run in Massachusetts? Pardon me? How strong will Romney run in Massachusetts? Well, in my district, uh, he's doing pretty well. We, we did a base run in fall. It's been a couple months. We'll be polling again very soon. Uh, but in our baseline, he was only down by five. Which in Massachusetts, five months out is fantastic. Um, Brown was up by about ten. So both of those guys, having them above me on the ticket, is very helpful. Uh, if nothing else, there's a lot of liberals in the state who are very disappointed with Obama because they didn't get, you know, a single payer and the rest of it. Um, they think he hasn't done enough to wreck, wreck the economy. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm optimistic that at least some of those people are going to stay home. They're not scared enough of Romney to come out. They've seen him in Massachusetts. They think he's all right. Um, I'm optimistic. So I think both, having both of those up on the end of the ticket is going to be very helpful. Uh, does your campaign have your website set up so that supporters from throughout the country can log in and get comments to check out? I can't believe I didn't plug in my website. <laughs> SeanForCongress.com. S E A N F O R. Get out of the pencil. Congress.com. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing that a little bit later, but certainly there's a, a number of ways to communicate on um, there. I think that's, uh, that's my cue. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much.